Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and a very warm welcome to Friday Frightworks. And this week, I wanted to take a look at one of the most frequent lesson requests that I've had since I've been posting to YouTube, and that is my cover of Tavlo's Talking Body. Just quickly before we delve into it, I wanted to say that the tabs for this are available and linked below in the description box through my website. I can't, however, make the backing track available, unfortunately, purely for the fact that I didn't make it. It is the official instrumental version, albeit I chopped and changed the structure of it in a couple of places, elongated some sections and shortened other parts, but if you want to check that out, it is on YouTube and I shall link it in the description box. As I said, the tabs are available. Check them out through my website. They took an eternity to tab this out. So uh, if you do want to learn it note for note, they are there. But if not, today's video is going to be more of an overview of a couple of key parts, a couple of specific points, which I think should be interesting. And hopefully uh, it should give you guys a couple of things to get your teeth into. So the first bit I want to touch upon is the opening notes, actually. I have a lot of questions about them. They're, in essence, two note harmonies or two finger harmonies, all played on my D and B strings, um, the ascending kind of chords if you're not familiar with which bit I'm on about sounds a little bit like this. So I should run you through what those are quickly, as I said they're all on your D and B strings, starting on your ninth and 8th fret. Down to your 7th. 4th and 3rd, 5th, repeat that, resolving then to your 2nd and 1st fret. In essence it's a C major harmony, these are all truncated versions of chords really. Just more simple way of playing it, I guess. Um, right, the next bit then um, is the very first part of what I guess you could consider the lead part of the track. Um, played in its entirety at full tempo, sounds like this. So just to break that down, or at least a couple of key parts of it very quickly, um, play a slow tempo, probably be a good place to start. That is definitely the first thing we're touching upon. It's something I've referenced in numerous lesson videos I've done in the past. It's that kind of double slide thing. So we've slid up to your 12th fret from your 10th on the moment before, and then we're gonna kind of redo it, I guess, from your 11th fret, from your 10th fret. It doesn't really matter because the note you're coming from isn't the feature or isn't the prominent part of it. It's the note you're landing on. And as long as you don't linger on that initial note, you can get away with sliding from wherever within reason. Eleventh fret is marginally more subtle and marginally more kind of flowing, I guess. But as I said, it is whatever you want to do. The next part then is going to be a half step bend on your twelfth fret on your B, which then resolves in the looser sense of the word because it is a little bit of a kind of finger twister to get your get your head or your fingers round if you've never done it before. Resolving to a full step bend on your tenth fret of your B.
Now I'm using 10 and a half gauge strings on here, which especially on a seven and a quarter radius can be a little bit difficult to be honest, but if you've never done this type of thing before, making sure that you internet your bends correctly, by which I mean you're pitching your bends correctly, is absolutely essential. If you're overbending or underbending, wobbling free, it's gonna sound terrible either way you look at it. Either of those, total no-go. So making sure that you know which note you're aiming for, ultimately half-step bend on your 12th into a full-step bend on your 10th. As you're coming down off that full-step bend on your 10th fret, very subtle slide up to your 11th fret before going back down to your 10th fret before resolving to your 8th fret. back to your ninth fret on your G. And then that very last bit, it's up to you really whether you slide it or bend it. Um, it's a very subtle little quiver, I guess, for want a better phrase. It's a, that kind of vocal inflection kind of thing I'm going for a lot of the time. On your 10th fret, very subtly alluding to your 11th fret. As I said, whether you actually physically slide to your 11th fret or not is entirely up to you. I would say it sounds marginally more natural if you just bend and kind of allude to it, a little bit more shades of grey rather than being a very deliberate, very definite action. Entirely personal preference, whatever works for you guys. We're going to repeat the first part of that lick then before working your way up to your 14th fret on your thinnest E string with a half step bend, which as you're falling off it, again similar to earlier, very subtle little uh, kind of slide up to your 15th before resolving back to your 14th. So 15th fret on your B string, 14th fret on your G before sliding up to your 16th fret before sliding up to your 17th fret. Then we're going to fall all the way from your 17th fret down to your 12th fret, again all on your G string. This is harder to do, to be honest, with a clean sound, or at least playing it cleanly is. Um, in the track itself, I have a fair amount of gain, and it's a little bit easier to kind of slide between notes, not necessarily in terms of accuracy, but carrying that momentum over and making, feel, making it feel as though you're not kind of uh, dying in death waiting for the note to sustain. So, as I said... Again, you're going to slide up from your 12th fret to your 14th before falling all the way down to your 5th fret. Again, I played that 14th fret there just because it felt like the sustain was kind of ebbing away. If you're doing that with gain, you can get away with sliding it all. Now, a massive part of that is making sure that when you're sliding around, you're not missing the frets that you're aiming for. Good little way to practice this is taking any fret, doesn't matter which, and aiming for another fret. Now, a good way to practice this and make sure you're pitching them correctly is just going to be sliding between octaves. So maybe your third fret on your B string, sliding up to your 15th fret. Something like that, just a cool little kind of practice technique to make sure that you can slide uh, accurately between them. It's a Buck and Evans track, um, which has a very similar start where you're sliding from a C minor chord up to a C minor chord up the octave. And it's always the most nerve wracking part of the set, making sure that if you are going to do it, and you're doing it as the first track sometimes, you don't want to be walking on and going, Hello, Cleveland! It's the worst moment in the world. So making sure that whether it's chords, whether it's just a single note, making sure they're accurate. Big importance on that. Uh, moving on to the next part, um, which to be honest is the most important part, at least for me at least, and really what I wanted to stress in this video is the melody. Uh, now prior to that, worth mentioning, we have a couple of chords, E minor, D major, G to C. Then, as I said, we have the melody. Now, couple of reasons this is important, not just in making sure that you actually play it, but how you play it. For me, at least with any of these guitar jam videos, making sure that I reference the melody or reference the motif or reference any kind of strong rhythmic feature of the original track gives it some semblance of being based in reality and not just turning into 
I don't know, three and a half minutes of mindless kind of guitar shred, you know. This isn't carte blanche to do what you want. And if you are going to try and do one of these kind of guitar jam videos, for me at least, you know, speaking from my own personal opinion, making sure that it does reference the original and in some way, shape or form, does still feel like a song, I think is incredibly important. People like Joe Satriani, Steve Vai do it incredibly well. Instrumental stuff but still has melody, still has groove, still has some sense of structure ultimately. And making sure that you reference original parts from the original track is a very easy, very cool way of doing that. So, as I said, the melody itself um, sounds like this. Again, slightly sloppy with uh, with such a clean sound. It's easier to do with uh, a little bit of gain, but always easier to demonstrate things with a clean sound. Now, the reason I wanted to touch upon this, or another reason, is not just in making sure that you play it, but how you play it. Now the notes themselves when I play it like that are quite far apart and again it is very uh, reliant on making sure that you are hitting the notes that you're aiming for. It would be much easier to do something like but at least in my personal opinion it's kind of devoid of character, devoid of that natural kind of vocal fluidity or inflections that make vocal chords vocal chords. They're imperfect, you get little fluctuations, you get little kind of uh, quivers, I guess, while you're waiting to pitch on the notes, you get the vibrato and the natural tremolo of voice. So emulating that, I think, is a massive way of making your guitar sound less like a guitar, more like a set of vocal chords, I guess, giving you a kind of fluidity and freedom. So, yes, it is a little bit more difficult than maybe just playing the notes in the kind of easiest proximity that they may be, but is worth it, I think. Um, so, to break that down quickly... So we're going to slide up to your 15th fret, and then the difficult bit is going to... You're sliding up to your 12th fret, which, having been on your 15th fret, sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but you have to slide back down to your 10th fret from your 15th before sliding back up to your 12th, if that makes sense. Making sure that you pitch those notes or really get them accurately is a massive part of this. And if you slide in, again, not a good luck. The last thing I want to touch upon very quickly is that you might have noticed throughout the course of the track I play that melody or that motif in a few different places and that's not really, it's not showing off mindlessly for the sake of it, it's because they sound different. I was watching a Tom Bukovac video recently where he made that very point saying if, if you know something and you feel like you want to get more comfortable with it or more comfortable with the guitar neck as a whole, take a little motif or a little phrase and play it in as many places as you can, not just because it opens up the neck but they all sound different. Thicker strings sound different to thinner strings even if you are in essence playing the same note in the same octave. Um, so the next one... <laughs> play that at the very end, so that's all on your G and on your D strings. Um, if you play it on your A and your D, I do that in the last solo, as I also do. Obviously thicker strings are going to sound slightly darker, slightly more dead, I guess, than obviously very lively comparatively playing that on your G and your B strings. As I said, if you want to get into this note for note, obviously the tabs are available on my website. I just wanted to give a slightly better overview, I guess, of um, why I play some of the stuff that I do. Not just the kind of little fluctuations or techniques, but making sure that it is kind of grounded in some sense of reality, I think is a very important feature. If you look at the, um, the cover I did of Redbone, again, that kind of refers to or harks back to the melody really frequently throughout the track. And it gives you a little bit of a launch pad then to maybe go for another solo off the back of that, or we'll punctuate a solo. You know, the, the outro on this track is primarily chords going back to that melody. So after I've done the big solo that I kind of uh, did again for the intro of this video, it's... Uh really 
really, really simple just playing open chords, and it's one of the coolest parts of it, for me at least, because it's the kind of the big crescendo at the outro, and then you've got that kind of... <laughs> it doesn't quite sound the same clean, does it, for some reason? Um, there you have it. I hope that kind of makes some sense. As I said, check out the tabs if you want to uh, learn it in full. But if there's any covers of these floating around on Instagram in the next couple of days, please do tag me. I love to see it. So, um, as ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching, and I shall see you next time. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon. <laughs>